Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge and welcome to Eldridge and Company. My guest today is Mark Levine, the city council member who for the first last eight years has represented the seventh district of Northern Manhattan. But come January, he'll represent all Manhattanites when he becomes its borough president. So welcome, Mark. I'm so glad to have you here. Uh, let Thank me you, just... Ronnie. It's wonderful to be back. You're welcome. You know, the most you've been one of the leaders, I think, in uh, covering the COVID uh, epidemic. And um, it's been also because you're the chair of the uh, health committee. That's right. Uh, so are you, and it's one of the strong points in your um, campaign that you're going to have a czar for COVID. That's right. So let's right. talk about that. What's happening with COVID now? Well, I'll tell you, um, I am relieved uh, the progress our city has made in vaccination, putting us ahead of most of the rest of the country. Um, but cases are rising now again. And uh, there, we still have the holidays ahead of us. We have the weather getting colder and people are going back into uh, indoor settings to socialize. And so um, it's just a little too soon for us to let our guard down. And that especially applies to people who have not yet been vaccinated, really. Um, I hear sometimes from people who say, uh, you know, I've made it this far without a vaccine, the pandemic's over, so uh, it's not necessary. It's really not true. Um, there's real risk out there. We're seeing, Ronnie, an average of over 1,100 cases every day in the five boroughs of New York City now. That's a lot, isn't it? And, and yes, it is, it's, and it's mostly on unvaccinated people. But we're uh, also seeing vaccinated people getting it too. Yes, yeah, some, um, although thankfully, those cases are more likely to be mild and not to develop into serious cases that require hospitalizations. Um, but also it does appear that, um, that the benefits of the vaccine do wane over time. And it's why the city's health department has just announced that anyone, any adult can now get a booster shot um, if they're six months out of uh, Pfizer or Moderna uh, their second shot, or even just two months out of their Johnson & Johnson shot. So we do have challenges now with the weather getting colder and still significant amount of spread and um, vaccines starting to wane. And, and we do need people to get their vaccine if they haven't, to get vaccinated if they're vulnerable, to still wear their mask in um, high-risk settings, and to get tested regularly, especially if you go to a, a large event. But the good news here, and I know we'll talk more about this, is that I do think we have a chance to manage this pandemic to the point where it's no longer a crisis so that we can begin to deal with the many underlying challenges that we face here in Manhattan. Now, what do you think the underlying, let me just ask you, what do you think about um, the New Year's Eve celebration? Given that it's going to be screened uh, for full vaccination, not just a single shot, but full vaccination, and that masking is going to be required, um, I think it's fine. Uh, I think those precautions will ensure, given that it is an outdoor setting, uh, that the, the risk will be minimized. We do want to celebrate, uh, and Times Square New Year's Eve is is uh, unique in the world, and so I'm I'm glad it's coming back. I think that managing this pandemic means that it doesn't disrupt our lives anymore; that we have mm -hmm. something like normal, and right. there'll be precautions that are going to remain in place for a long time, maybe forever. Um, we might be wearing masks on subways for a long time, for example, Incredible. but yeah. that has other benefits that uh, could Just prevent flu and other diseases. It's a part of life now. So yeah. what are the other underlying things that you're going to try well, to Well, First, the horrible um, inequality that's been revealed and exacerbated over the past year. It just can't be denied. Uh, we can't accept the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of people in this city who don't have access to health insurance. We need to get everybody the benefit of, of a primary care doctor and all that that means. Um, and we, we have to address other forms of inequality, which have also been highlighted painfully over the past year, inequality in, in housing and, and employment, um, inequality in the criminal justice system. Uh, all of it now needs to be addressed. Manhattan also has been particularly hit hard um, from the economic shock, losing uh, tourism, losing Broadway, losing in-person office work. 
Um, and yeah. we've got to come back. It's had a brutal impact on small business, on restaurants. And uh, Manhattan has been hit harder than almost anywhere in the country um, economically. Mm. Uh, we have the generational challenge of climate change, which uh, uh, should be our priority, all of our priority. Uh, I want to make Manhattan the global leader in the race to carbon neutrality. Uh, and that's going to require audacious policymaking. And I want us to deal with the climate change that is already here um, to protect us from the extreme weather uh, that has made us vulnerable on every part of this island, not just the coastline. We have a lot to do. And uh, I'm excited to hit the ground running in January. In a way, you could be mayor huh? right now. I went into the city council with a new charter in 89 when the board of estimate had been changed and the real allocation of different responsibilities to different officers. And basically that's when the, I think borough presidents lost a lot of their power in a way. Um, but this year, four of the five borough presidents you served with for four years. And it seems to me, I mean, for eight years, yes. it seems to me it's a great opportunity for you guys to get together and to really do take these actions together. You are absolutely right. Even, you know, it's such a good organizing thing. You are so right, Ronnie. Um, it's true that the, some of the explicit powers that the borough president had under the old system from 30 plus years ago are no longer in place, but there are still very important powers that the office has. It really, I think more than anything is a really important platform for setting out a bold agenda for the borough. Absolutely. And, and organizing to achieve it. But that power is really magnified when the borough presidents lock arms on a common agenda. And I think we have a special opportunity now because the incoming borough presidents um, in Brooklyn, Antonio Reynoso, great friend and colleague from the council over the past eight years, um, the incoming borough president in the Bronx, Vanessa Gibson, also a great friend, one of my closest partners in the council, and Donovan Richards, who's the incumbent in Queens, but he's been there for a little more than a year. Prior to that, we served together in the council. Um, and that's four of us that uh, share a lot of common values and, and I think can be a force uh, supporting the mayor when appropriate. Um, and I have high hopes for the mayor, but at times also pushing back um, if, if and when that's necessary. Um, Staten Island's borough president, uh, Vito Fasella, uh, is, is uh, a Republican, no secret, been endorsed by Trump. So um, not in the same place ideologically, but uh, there may be times where we have common interests uh, with him and with Staten Island. And in that case, um, I'm hopeful that we'll have all five of us working together. I served with him in the city council and uh, he was great. I mean, I, we were good friends. So I have great hopes for him. I don't that know. is wonderful to hear. In the times, you know, so we'll see what happens. But uh, he was uh, very reasonable. Oh, that's great to hear. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's very important also because you guys have got the, the bully pulpit to talk to the voters. I mean, you are the closest to the voters of the city. Yes. In, in a way, the council is yes. too, but it's more people to get together. So, I mean, I just am looking forward to this regime very much. What are, in, in land use, I mean, is there a way that you could all cooperate on siting of things? You know, I hope that we do because we've had a pattern for years of treating land use as a kind of a reactive exercise um, every time a proposal emerges, usually from a private developer. And uh, it's often incoherent and, and even um, inequitable. Um, most of our neighborhood rezonings, our upzonings have been in black and brown neighborhoods. That's true citywide and also specifically in Manhattan. Um, mostly that's occurred, occurred uptown. We need a, a comprehensive view of planning, borough-wide and, and all five boroughs together where we step back and, and say, that we need a plan for density at transit hubs and equity in development, and also accounting for infrastructure that um, needs to come along with new development, something that's often forgotten, things like school seats or expanded bus routes. 
uh, et cetera. And that doesn't happen when you take land use as a case by case fight. It happens when you take a comprehensive view. And I think that there could be an opportunity. In fact, I've spoken to um, some of my incoming colleagues as borough presidents about a comprehensive view for the city. And that really could be a game change um, to ensure that we grow because we need to grow. We need desperately need more affordable housing, but that we do it in an equitable way um, and a way that uh, I think takes a, a view of the environmental needs, the transportation needs, the school needs, uh, racial equity. Um, and I think it's a huge opportunity to work with my colleagues on that. I think so too. Was the last comprehensive plan done by Lindsay? Is it that long since we've had one? Uh, as far as I know. I yeah. mean, the, the last citywide rezoning was 1961. Right, and so that was, yeah. I mean, that. so that was earlier, but I think then the city planning commission did a comprehensive plan um, in 69 or 70, something my like that. Yeah, so, in the early 70s. Uh, long overdue and, to say the least. That's amazing. You were originally a teacher. Yes. What about education? <laughs> uh, one, it seems to me one of the really important things, I mean, aside from having a good ed education and an equal kind of education and for kids and everything, is that less than 20% of eligible voters voted in your election this year. That's, how, that's unbelievable, isn't it? We don't- Yes, it's, it's, very, it's very disappointing. And that, yeah. it seems to me the only way that can be corrected is through schools, educating people about what it means to be a, a citizen or a resident of a community. Um, we do need, we, we certainly need to expand civic education. Um, people need to understand um, particularly their role as, as agents for, mm -hmm. for change in, in government. Um, and we need to do more to recruit young people into community boards and other opportunities for leadership. You know, high school kids are eligible for community board membership. Absolutely. Um, but but right. very few apply. And we need to be out in the schools delivering that message of, of civic engagement. Um, but I, I will say on, on turnout, Ronnie, that um, we, we, we look at red states and other parts of the country uh, with disdain at some of the barriers they put up to voting, but there are barriers here in New York State as well that need to come down. Um, it, it's too difficult to register to vote. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to register up to the day of, of the election. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's that there are barriers to getting a uh, vote by mail or ballot. Yeah. Um, uh, outside of the pandemic period, you have to have a qualified excuse. Um, there should be no excuse, absentee voting. Uh, we need to make it easier. And in fact, we had um, amendments to the constitution on the ballot in November, uh, well, in the election of, of a few weeks ago that would have made some of these improvements and they were rejected by the voters because there was a, concert, a concerted effort, a well-financed right. effort, a multi-million dollar campaign run by uh, more conservative elements of the state to, to get people to vote no. And the state Democratic Party did not have an equivalent campaign in favor of these ballot questions to vote yes. And they all failed. All three, all three of the democracy, democracy connected election protection questions uh, had a majority no vote. It's a, it's a real failure in my opinion, of the democratic establishment in New York State. I, I'm in total agreement with you. It certainly is not a strong body, right? You, you get elected I, I'd like to see it uh, small d <laughs> democratized. And, uh, and it was so intimately connected with the personality of former Governor, Governor Cuomo, the mm -hmm. interests of former Governor Cuomo. Uh, I'd like to see a more open and small d democratic party now. Right. Uh, but the, the failures on those ballot questions, the failures in this election more broadly, we had a red wave in New York State. We had a red wave in New York City. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the big reporting was on Virginia and New Jersey, yeah, right. but um, <laughs> you know, we, had, we, 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 had, we lost a number of Democratic city council seats um, that many? flipped to Republican for the first time in a long time. And we, we had uh, a couple of seats that 
uh, only remained Democratic by a tiny margin. In fact, the vote counts just came out in the last couple of days. And thank goodness, um, okay. two great Democrats, Justin Brandon and Bay Ridge and Ari Kagan, um, right. also South Brooklyn, more in Coney Island, uh, won on paper ballots. But it shouldn't have been that close. No. Uh, th there was a great Democratic candidate for borough president in Staten Island who lost uh, something like two to one. Um, there were Democratic judges who lost in, uh, in Queens. Uh, uh, Councilmember Paul Vallone, an amazing uh, elected official uh, and an attorney, lost a judgeship because That's of the right. red wave. Uh, <laughs> how often does that happen? His, so, father um, must, his father must be in disbelief, right? <laughs> I it, don't. It, it, it's outrageous. I mean, he's such a, a stand up, yeah. honorable guy uh, and would be a great judge. So I think it, 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 we don't just have a, a national problem. Democrats in New York City and New York State um, need to do more to reach out to working class voters um, who are alienated now. And uh, if we don't, we're gonna have another tough year in 2022. Yeah, we well, definitely. So Mark, how did you get into politics? I mean, you majored in physics at college, right? Yes. And then went to the Harvard uh, School of what do they call it? Political Kennedy School of Government. Kennedy School, yeah. Um, yeah. public admin, public whatever it was. Policy, so yeah. how did the? I mean, how did that switch? <laughs> what kind of a family? Did, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Maryland. Um, my 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 father, who passed away in 2013, was uh, uh, actually he was a, a, a doctor working in public health. Uh -huh. uh, he didn't leave, live sadly long enough to see me uh, chair the health committee, but. Uh, I miss him terribly. Uh, I yeah. would have loved to have him around. Been during this so pandemic. pleased to see you. Yes, but definitely. He, he gave me a love of science. And my, my mother, uh, who is still alive and still a, a huge positive force in my life, is, is, a, is a social activist uh, through much of her life, marched with Dr. King at Selma. And so I had growing up, um, uh, not, not just a love of science instilled in me, but uh, a deep commitment to social activism. Uh, and so when I graduated college with a physics degree, I, I didn't want to spend my life in a laboratory and becoming a teacher, teaching science in the South Bronx was just a marvelous way to both share my love of science with young people, but uh, I felt also have an impact um, and help create opportunity. I taught at junior high school 149 in the South Bronx um, in the early 90s. And I really spent a lot of time with my the families of my students, and um, it was it was quite clear that very few had any connection to the formal financial system. Um, most didn't have bank accounts or credit cards, and were relying on pawn shops and loan sharks. And so I, I really became very focused on on economic opportunity. And I went back to graduate school to get a, a, a master's in public policy to focus on that. And I started a nonprofit coming out of grad school, right. a, a community development credit union called Neighborhood Trust. It's still going strong uh, in and Washington Heights. Millions of dollars. Yes, yeah, so, uh, over $25 million in small loans, uh, averaging just a few thousand dollars each, and also giving people savings and checking accounts, a place to access financial services. Um, the membership is 99% uh, Latino and African-American. And uh, it's helping people buy their first home computer, buy their... Uh, start a small business, become owners of their own home. And, you know, Ronnie, the repayment rate is 98%, uh, better than commercial banks. Isn't it's a real crazy? testament to Uptown. And that's the base that allowed me to run for office. Uh, 5,000 members at the time I first ran. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud now to have won election twice uh, in the fabulous 7th Council District, which, as you mentioned, is Uptown, and you cover Washington a lot. Uh, you're even going to come time. down to part of the Upper West. But you're basically, yes. What you basically are is you're the Upper West Side. I represent 96th Street uh, up through Morningside Heights, uh, West Harlem, Hamilton Heights, and Washington Heights up to 165. Uh, and I live with uh, my family on 163rd. Now you're bilingual. How did that happen? Um, I uh, did my junior year of college at the University of Seville, Spain, the only American in an 800 student physics department. And so uh, I, my Spanish got be better very fast. And then as a teacher, I was a bilingual teacher in the Bronx and 
So I, I lectured in Spanish in some of the classes. And um, uh, actually my wife is from Puerto Rico. And we speak Spanish at home. Our kids' first language is Spanish. Yeah. Um, but also representing a district which is um, 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 majority Latino. Uh, it sometimes feels like I use more Spanish in the day than English. <laughs> That's uh, so but I, 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 I'm a lover of languages. I speak Hebrew and a smattering of other languages. It's, it's one of my great passions in life. So you mentioned your sons. I mean, I'm a great, I'm always interested in how people become who they are politically. And uh, I mean, I came from a family also that was very interested in public affairs and things that went on. What are your sons, what are they interested in? Well, um, <laughs> you're probably not gonna be surprised to hear this. My older, our older son, Alejandro, who's a, a senior at City College, is majoring in political science. Uh, <laughs> He's a little more interested in kind of foreign affairs, but uh, very proud of him. Uh, my, our younger son, Daniel, is a first year at Temple University. Um, and he is uh, applying to the nursing school there and minoring in public health. So, uh, you know, they, they might deny that any of that is due to me, but uh, I take quiet uh, pleasure. I, I don't they think that's really amazing, true. Uh, kids that I, I couldn't be prouder of. What are you going to do when you start first day as borough president? Well, um, I'm taking over this role at a time of crisis for the city. Uh, this is comparable to 9-11. Uh, uh, and actually, I was chatting uh, this week with uh, one of my predecessors, C. Virginia Fields, um, who's actually going to be one of the co-chairs of our transition committee. And uh, she was borough president um, for the for for 9/11, and and mm -hmm. her second term really uh, was defined uh, by 9/11. So we've been talking about what that meant for the office. Um, I'm entering at an analogous moment, a crisis uh, of the magnitude, at least of 9/11, arguably even greater. And uh, so I'm going to continue to fight uh, as a public health warrior to ensure that. We do manage this pandemic in ways I spoke about earlier to the point where it's not a crisis anymore, um, but quickly pivot to the broader effort to, to bring Manhattan back. And we, we are gonna designate one of our senior team members a COVID recovery czar to support small business, to support the comeback of Broadway and arts and entertainment more broadly, um, but also to deal with some of the underlying challenges, which uh, unfortunately probably have not gotten adequate attention during the period of the pandemic, um, the homeless crisis and the related challenges of mental health and mm -hmm. substance abuse and, and, and affordable housing, which is itself an emergency. Um, so you talk a about approach. a holistic approach. You're yeah, this is all connected. That, right? it's, it, it's all connected. Certainly housing is connected to homelessness, is connected to mental health, is connected to, um, to uh, substance abuse. Um, but really, to, to an extraordinary extent, climate and resiliency is an umbrella which unites so much of this. Um, it's public space and green space. Um, it's our transportation system. It's how we use sidewalks and rooftops. And uh, it is our food system because um, there's such a climate impact to as we shift to plant-based diet. It's our waste management impact because there's a climate impact when we um, compost more. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's electrifying everything. It's changing the city's vehicle fleet. Um, I really see that uh, for the next eight years, climate and resiliency are going to be a grand uh, unifying theme for me as borough president, um, protecting the coastline, um, hardening infrastructure in our subways, uh, greening infrastructure so that we have more street trees. I want another million trees for New York City. Uh, there are parts of Manhattan which don't have their fair share of street trees. This is an equity issue. Equity permeates uh, every issue I've spoken about. Um, environmental justice, um, uh, oh. unfortunately, uh, is a reality in Manhattan, especially uptown where there's a disproportionate number of bus depots contributing right. to um, the high rates of, of asthma uptown. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of ways where communities of color are impacted disproportionately hard by climate change. So 
equity will permeate everything I do um, in the climate space and the public health space and the housing space. Um, there is so much to take on. Uh, it's a little intimidating to lay it all out, but I'm actually really confident that we can do this, that New York City can do this, partly because we have a great um, new generation of leadership coming in, an unbelievably diverse and dynamic city yeah. council. Um, uh, how many men, women were in the city council when you, when you were there, Ronnie? I can't, that, I don't remember uh, that. Probably I, under 20. We have- Oh, uh, oh please, no. Yeah, well, maybe under to, 10. I'm sorry to tell you this, but we have to uh, say goodbye. But well, in the meantime, uh, <laughs> a great vision for eight years, and I'm looking forward to seeing that vision continue after the eight years. So lots of good luck. <laughs> and Thank I you, Ronnie, we for having me on the show. Thank, Thank you for what you've done for this city and continue oh, to do. You are Thanks. a treasure. Thanks, Mark. Be well. <laughs>